Episode of Jay Leno's Garage Pandemic Edition. Once again, we are doing this one camera on a tripod. There's nobody here. It's, uh, well, let's get to the car we're talking about. This is a Pratt & Miller C6 RS Corvette. It is based on the Z06 Corvette 2006 edition. Pratt & Miller, if you're not familiar, <clears throat> they were the racing arm of General Motors, hugely successful at Le Mans, won it a bunch of time, a bunch of class wins for Corvette, just amazing work that they did. Also for Cadillac, helped them uh, be victorious a numerous number of times, just amazing amount of times. And they decided prior to the ZR1 coming out, uh, a lot of people like Corvettes, it was always the affordable sports car, a lot of people had problem with the interior, didn't think it looked good enough or rich enough, uh, and a few other minor things. I never had that problem with it. I always liked Corvettes for exactly what they were, but okay, I get it. So they decided to build the ultimate road-going Corvette. Now this is not, uh, although it uses all their race car technology, a lot of their race car technology, it is a road car, and I'll get into that in a minute. What they did was, they took out the Corvette engine, put a KTEC block, 8.2 liters, that's I think about 500 cubic inches, aluminum block. Uh, they're, they're the people who built the engines for Le Mans with Pratt & Miller, they're the, also the racing arm. They, their own crank, their own, it's their own motor. It's not based on the, uh, they don't modify the existing engine. The transmission is a uh, Tremec, I think T56, totally blueprinted. This is all carbon fiber. The only thing not carbon fiber, I believe, are the door skins, uh, I think the roof panel, and then right here, the hatch. Uh, but the rest are, is all carbon fiber. Custom suspension pieces, they completely disassemble the car. What they do is, you give them your donor Z06, they literally tear it apart, they pull out all the soundproofing and they redo it with Dynamat to make it a little bit quieter. You'll notice this is about one and a half inches wider than the standard Corvette. Uh, you've got these amazing louvers here. There is nothing here that is uh, not functional. These louvers, everything works for its intended purpose. The aerodynamics are superior to what Corvette did. Uh, they wanted to build the ultimate Corvette and it was hugely expensive. I think it was $185,000 plus your Z06. So it really took it into the realm of the Lamborghinis and the Ferraris and everything price-wise, but it also did it performance-wise as well. Don't forget, back in 2006, 600 horsepower was a huge number. Uh, I think 500 was about the limit for most cars. I think it addressed a lot of the problems people had with the Corvette. Then the ZR1 came out uh, just prior to, they only built seven of these. This is car number one. Uh, we built this one for SEMA, and at the time, uh, we built it to run on flex fuel, E85 or gasoline, could run on either one. Uh, we thought that might be the future back in 2006, but uh, growing crops for gasoline rather than food, I think that just caused too many problems. I think the intention was good, but it didn't really work out. Uh, but that's what it was. Uh, and so we debuted this car at SEMA. It was a huge hit, got a, got a, lot, of, uh, a lot of attention. And if, in fact, if you Google Pratt & Miller uh, Corvettes or Pratt & Miller C6 RS, you'll see some road tests on it. And people really, really liked it. It wasn't one of these performance stripe packages where they take a Corvette and just doll it up. This has a lot of racecraft, uh, racing rather, engineering and aerodynamics in it. And it's really a terrific car to drive. Here's your center lock wheel. That big socket fits right over there and that tightens it instead of a knockoff. Knocks off, knockoffs are illegal now. Uh, you've got an 18 inch wheel in the front. You've got 19s in the back. So that gives it a nice comfortable ride. These are all functional. And you know, when I got this, 
I was a little scared because I brought it to California, go, oh man, 8.2 liter, all aluminum, purpose-built block. I think they use the Z06 heads and modify them a little bit, if I'm not mistaken, I could be wrong. Uh, and I thought, oh man, when I get my first emissions test, I'm gonna have to park this thing in the garage because I'm not gonna be able to license it in California. So I drove it sparingly. And then uh, when the two years, whatever the time period came around, I joined, went to the smog shop with it, gave the guy the thing, yeah, go ahead, pass. And it passed. Uh, so to me, Mike Atkins and the boys at Pratt & Miller, thank you very much, because that was my biggest fear. I didn't really drive it much, because I figured if I got pulled over and I had to show a smog, I, I, just, I didn't think it would pass, but it did. And to this day, it has passed every year since 2006 when I got it. So a uh, testament to them. As you can see, we've got a lot of louvers here for the rear brakes as well. Um, suspension, a lot of their stuff from their race shop. You know, Pratt & Miller really is a terrific uh, organization. And what they've managed to accomplish with GM products and racing is, is pretty amazing. I mean, just look up the record. You'll see all the class wins at Le Mans. You know, I, I don't think Corvette got as much credit as it deserved for winning Le Mans so many times, it just became one of those things, oh, Corvette's gonna win, you know. I mean, it was nice to see Americans go there and, and, and do well, especially with a car like this. In fact, the engine in my Tornado, you know, that one we built a while ago, that has one of Pratt & Miller's engines in it. Uh, that, uh, one of the engines, I believe, that it won at Le Mans, if I'm not mistaken. Anyway, okay, let's, uh, let's open the hood. Let's take a look at the engine. That's the most impressive piece on this car. Uh, all right, quiet. Eight point two liter. There it is. Okay. As you can see, all the carbon fiber, the intake manifold, uh, the hood. And don't forget, this is 2006. This is when carbon fiber was not as commonplace as it is today. You know, when uh, they built the McLaren F1, it was like 2,000 hours to make the shell. And now it's down to an hour and a half in, in the autoclave to make the shell. So, I mean, it shows you how, how fast that technology can move. But it's all beautifully built. I mean, they just did a wonderful, wonderful job. And it's all built to race spec. This has been the most dependable car. I've never had anything go wrong with it. I've never had it fail a smog test. Uh, something else it has, which they put in, is a lift system. It's got a pump, and they press it, and it'll come up about three inches, uh, and obviously go down as well, because it sits lower than the standard Corvette, but they wanted to make it a road car because of, you know, driveways and, uh, ramps and all kinds of things like that. You just press a button, the front end comes up. So um, a lot of cars have that now, but that was fairly rare back in 2006. But this is all just nicely, uh, nicely done, as you can tell. The engine's about, I think it's 11.1 compression ratio. As I said, a little over 600 horsepower. Don't know exactly how much over it is, but uh, considering this car's got 14 years old, it still looks, still looks good inside. You know, the real trick I always say is to try not to get them too wet. You know, I, I kind of wipe everything down. After I run a car like this, especially in the heat, I'll leave the hood open to get the heat out of it because although it doesn't distort anything, I don't think it does it any good. It does tend to dry out, dry out wires and stuff like that. But all the rubber, everything is still pretty supple on this car. And uh, as I said, this is car number one of seven. They only built seven of these. It's a dry sump system also, which is pretty cool. Uh, and it's normally aspirated. Uh, people think that's a supercharger. It's not. It's normally aspirated. The ZR1 came out, and uh, there's been a lot of debate which one is faster. I think this one is, at least according to the road test, better handling, uh, just because of all the race tech in it. And it, it probably might pull it just because of the torque. You know, I always say uh, horsepower sells cars, but torque wins races. The trouble is this was, what, a double the price of a ZR1? And it's debatable whether you consider that worth it or not. But uh, one of only seven, it makes it a rare Corvette. And when you go to Corvette uh, 
uh, gatherings, you know. These get a lot of respect because people know it's not just a, you know, a stripe and wheel package. It's, it's the real deal. And the guys at Pratt & Miller are just, uh, just incredible engineers and uh, incredible builders. They just do a beautiful, beautiful job. You know, I know a lot of people have cars built by outside firms from Ford or Chrysler or, or General Motors, and it's never up to this standard, you know. I mean, this, this, is, this is something I think GM was proud to be associated with and put their name on just because of all the racing successes. So, come on, let's move around to uh, the back of the vehicle. But it's really from the rear of the vehicle, you see how Kardashian it is. I mean, this is the, the widest Corvette I've ever seen. Uh, and uh, they managed to, it managed to integrate it pretty well. Let's, let me open this up here, show you the... All right, here's the tool they give you. I've loosened the straps already. You see, uh, you put this whole deal together, it's... it's a, Hell of a torque wrench, and then down in this little cubby hole here, which every Corvette has. Let me pull out the. Ah, uh, there's your socket. That fits on there, and then you hold the only tighten the wheel to how many foot pounds it is. So that's pretty cool. Let me show you the original brochure that we handed out at SEMA. This is it here. That's the back side. That's the front side. There's the back side of the brochure right there. Uh, what I would do if you want to read what it says is probably just freeze frame it and take a look. And of course the great thing about Corvette is probably the only car in this power range, if you will, that has this kind of trunk space. You could put half a dozen golf clubs or sets of golf clubs in this thing if you wanted to. Here, let's close this up and I'll show you the interior. Well, as you can see, I think this is the greatest Corvette interior I've ever seen. I know they do about, I think it said uh, 150 hours they spent uh, stitching uh, these interiors for these cars. I mean, they really went above and beyond. I think it's just a beautiful, beautiful job. Because if anybody had, a, like I said, a complaint about the Corvette, they didn't like the interior, it didn't match Lamborghini and Ferrari, and even though those were two, three, four times the price of one of these. This wheel is beautiful wheel, nicely done. Uh, you got heated seats. Um, you know, all that sounds standard now, which you get even in a standard Corolla or Kia. But back in 2006, that was a big deal, especially in a performance car. You know, Americans love torque, and with 650 foot-pounds of torque, even a lot of European exotics that have V12s and more horsepower, they don't have this low-end grunt like, like these things do. You know, and it's, it's pretty amazing. And this is a normally aspirated car, and it does over 200 miles an hour. I don't, I'm not sure if this is the first Corvette to do over 200 miles an hour but at least it's a qualified, honest 200 miles an hour. With these aerodynamics, with the suspension changes, you can drive it on the street. <clears throat> it's not a race car for the street, but it's race car technology for the street. I know you can take these to Ron Fellows or any of those uh, test tracks, and it'll, it'll pretty much blow the doors off of anything that's out there. But in Corvette circles, these get a lot of respect because there are a lot of people who modify Corvettes and the factory uh, like that, you know, whereas Pratt & Miller, they're sanctioned, they know what they're doing. I mean, I've had this thing, oh my God, 14 years. Uh, but let's listen to it start. And look, you can raise the, watch the front end come up. The great thing about this car is you can't reach the level of performance it's capable of on the street, at least not without going to jail. But 
That being said, you've got enough of a cushion. I mean, it handles so incredibly well. It's really just a great, well, come on. We'll take a ride and I'll show you what I'm talking about. I'm a little embarrassed to admit I got the same tires on this thing that it came with. I've only got just about 10,000 miles on this car. And uh, these tires are about 15 years old. So any, any time you hit the, hit the gas and almost any gear, you just break them loose. You know, uh, tires for a vehicle like this, if you're driving it hard, should be changed every two to three years. And uh, yeah, 13 years is a little long. But that being said, they just got plenty of tread on them. They're just uh, a little hard. So you got to, you know, it's not till you try to light them up, you realize, oh my God, you can light them up in any gear. It's, it's, it's crazy. This transmission is so nice. You know, when Pratt & Miller said they blueprinted the transmission, what that means is they just go through it and they make sure all the tolerances are correct or exactly what they should be. Uh, it's not, they don't, beef it up or make it stronger, they just glue them. They make it the perfect version of what it should be. And that's what this is. It just shifts so nicely. It's such a pleasure to shift. I mean, I've got a couple of cars that have yeah, some synchro problems and whatnot. Yeah, horrible. Whereas this, it's just like butter. It just slips right into gear. As I said before, they replaced all the uh, standard Corvette sound dynamic material with Dynamat, which is a more heat resistant, keeps less heat from coming through the cabin, and is also quieter. Dy Dynamat is about the best stuff you can use if you're trying to insulate, and uh, that's what they use here. Um, they really spared no expense on this. I mean, I'm sure they didn't want this thing to cost as much as it did, but when you look at the workmanship involved, as I said, 150 hours just to do the interior, those things on YouTube where guys leave the car and coffee and then they nail the thing and it slides across the, the road and smashes into the Audi parked on the other side of the street, whatever it might be. Uh, usually the problem is bad tires. Not bad tires, just old tires. You know, I think that was the problem with uh, that uh, Porsche that our friend Paul Walker passed away in. Those were at least eight, probably 10 year old tires. And especially on that car, oh my God, you know, you've got no traction at all. I mean, tires start to deteriorate the day you put them on. I can say, luckily this car is garage most of the time, so the tires have not been uh, out in the sun, so they're not cracked, but that doesn't mean they don't begin to break down, the composition gets hard, you've just got no, uh, well, you've got no traction at all. I mean. When you've got this kind of horsepower, you need the grippiest tires you can get, and 13-year-old tires are not good, so. You know, I consider Corvette to be the greatest performance bargain in probably all of uh, motorsports. I mean, what you get with the Z06, or even the new C7, is unbelievable to me. I mean, how they sell that car for 60 grand, you know, when you look at just what automobile paint costs, automobile paint now is like 600 bucks a quart. So that'll give you some idea. Then all the prep work and everything else. I don't know how they're able to do it. And the other thing I like about Corvette is whenever I read Car and Driver, or Road and Track, and they do one of these, uh, you know, sports car shootouts where they go to Thunder Hill or somewhere, the ones that always win are Porsche and Corvette because these are two cars that you can literally beat with a hammer and they don't break. And the fact that when I go to Corvette meets or Porsche meets, people brag about how many miles their car have on them instead of how few. You know, I go to a lot of the Italian exotic car shows and guys show you an Enzo, it's 28 years old, 19 miles, oh, all right, great. I, is your wife a virgin too? I mean, please stop. I mean, why, why would you want that? It makes no sense to me. And you know, that's the other thing too. Uh, people sometimes buy these supercars have been sitting for 15 or 20 years and they have, you know, limited mileage. 
The best thing you can do with a Lamborghini, a Ferrari, any of these cars, is to drive them at least on a regular basis. Not beat the hell out of them necessarily, but just drive them. Because what happens is, oil settles, you know, so this top of the seal is dry, and this top of the seal is wet. And consequently, if it sits for a year or a couple of years, the top of the seal drives out, dries out, and eventually you start it up and you got an oil leak or you got some other problem. You know, it's a bit like a human being. If it's just sedentary all the time, it's not going to, uh, it's not going to be able to move. Even, even in third gear, I feel it. I feel the tires start to slide just a hair. I'm glad I wasn't 16 years old when I got this thing. I'd be dead. Although I would have liked to have had it when I was 16. When I was 16, I was driving a 34 Ford, had the stock flathead in it, and then we put a 292 in it, which, <laughs> truth be told, wasn't much better. I, I never liked that wide. Was that the wide block Ford? I, 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 to me, my favorite Ford engine after that was the small block 289, 260, 302. I always thought that thin wall casting, I thought that was the greatest motor. And with a set of Webers on it, oh my God, it sounded unbelievable. This probably rides a tiny bit firmer than the stock Z06, but certainly not uncomfortable. And these seats are really comfortable. I remember once Aston Martin let me borrow one of the, uh, the Vantage. Beautiful car, 12-cylinder, manual transmission, but it had these Recaro butter-clenching seats that were so uncomfortable. I kept turning sidewards, and it was just awful. Hellcat does it right. They got big, comfortable seats. This is a nice, big, comfortable seat. And you've got the adjustments, too. Ew, man. Tires breaking loose. The tires just, <laughs> yeah, it's just, you know, it's like a lion. <laughs> it's like a lion on marble just trying to get its claws in. And it just, yeah, I got to take it easy. I got to take it easy. I just got to drive it. And, yeah, I can't bring myself to buy new tires until I at least wear these out a little bit. So. And I don't want to film myself doing burnouts anymore because, well, the authorities tend to frown on that. But boy, just a torque, you know, any gear you're in, oh, it just pulls so nicely. This is a wonderful car. Engineers just do stuff better. That's what I like about Pratt & Miller, you know. They're the perfect, they're race car guys and they're engineers. So with race car engineering, you got something fast, you got something dependable, and you got something safe. Because engineers don't like to let something out of their sight unless it's right. And that's why this car costs so much, you know? I don't believe they're probably making much profit on these, even at the price they charge, because it's all in the vehicle, you know? It's all in the reputation. It's funny, not that many people know what this is. Even Corvette guys go, what? What, what is that? You know, I've seen a number of these up for sale at auction. As I said, this is car number one. And a lot of guys don't seem to drive it. Mine's got 10,000 miles, which I don't consider any mileage at all, really. Yet most of the ones I see have 1,700 miles, 3,000 miles. This might be the highest mileage one, except for their test mule. I, I have no idea. But. I gotta wear these tires out, put some new ones on. You know, about, God, almost 20 years ago now, I took a Corvette on the Autobahn. And I was running about 170, something like that. And I realized most of the big BMWs and Mercedes were limited to 155. So I was just flying past people, you know. And I remember I would pull into a McDonald's or whatever it was, because they have McDonald's in Germany, because typical American, of course, they stop at McDonald's. And uh, kids would come running up with Corvette, Corvette. I mean, they acted like it was a Ferrari or a Lamborghini or something, because over there it was kind of, oh, what an exotic car it was. I mean, it just, it just sort of made me laugh, because Corvettes are so common here in America, but in Europe, in Europe, I know a lot of the European magazines didn't care for them. They got a little snooty. But people on the street, oh my God, the kids flocked to it, asked if they could sit in it, you know, all kinds of stuff. The new 
that most buff Corvette is, it's an aspirational car. It's a car, if you're a guy and you got your own business and maybe you had a bit of success, it's the kind of car you can afford to buy, you know? I mean, look, Lamborghinis, Ferraris, those are so far out of the reach, even Corvettes out of the reach for most folks. But in terms of bargain basement supercar performance, you can't beat Corvette. That's what I love about them. You know? That's what I love about them, you know? It's the kind of car you work hard and uh, you can attain it. Hey, it worked for me. We'll uh, whip this thing around, take it up in the freeway and go for a ride. But right now I'm going to sign out. So thanks, you guys. Thanks for watching. And uh, keep checking those tires. See you next week.